My name is Cora Carey, coordinator with the Sports Again. Partnership. And on behalf of the board, we are very grateful to Shane Satira for their support in hosting our launch this evening. A Cahirloch, a Ara, a Prevaimanig, a Dina Usha of the Cord of Galair, Ka'an or Osaram, Hoyle Kurid, Galair on Inisho. We hope you enjoyed the evening and leave with a greater insight into the happenings of Kerry Recreation Sports Partnership. I'd like to welcome all the special guests in the audience here this evening. We are fortunate tonight to have such a talented and calibre from the worlds of both local and national and international sport. And I look forward to hearing the conversations from all of you. I would like to extend messages to our new chairperson of the partnership, Jimmy Dean. This is a, a, a great initiative, um, the launch of the Recreation and uh, Sports Partnership. And from my point of view, uh, when I was appointed as uh, Minister of State for, with responsibility for tourism and sport, um, probably an odd choice that Indic any made in some ways, but um, the, the jury's still out in it, I suppose. But from my point of view, one of the things that I was very anxious to, to try and get a handle on was, <clears throat> first of all, to make sure that people had, regardless of their stage in life or their age in life or their position in life, uh, that they'd have access to and be able to participate uh, in a sport and a recreation of their choice in their local area as far as, as, far as possible. Uh, and to that end, we've done a number of things over the last 12 months. Uh, and in some ways, you know, it's difficult to you know, count them all, the things that we've done over the last 12 months. But one of the most important things that we did was we initiated for the first time ever, uh, consulted a process on the development uh, of a national sports policy. And this is hugely important because not only does it look at uh, things like high performance and our international athletes and our international reputation, but it also looks at um, the grassroots and local sports partnerships and how they're funded, how they're structured, how they're governed, their relationships to local authorities, uh, and then how you dare use that structure is used for the benefit and the uh, maximum enjoyment of the people for which they serve. On top of that, then, we also looked at, uh, over the last 12 months, the issue of governance. And this is another theme that's uh, in your document that we're launching here later on tonight. I still believe uh, in the grassroots investment. Uh, and we were just discussing this in the way in. Uh, and I have a, an issue in relation to the, my relationship of my department and the departments of education and housing. We need to make sure uh, that we don't repeat the same mistakes before as we did in terms of planning for the construction of all these houses that are going to be built without amenities. And the same token, we need to make sure that new schools that are going to be built with the uh, courtesy of the public purse have sports facilities that are open to the local community. And that's where I believe that the importance of the local sports partnerships who have good, strong, robust plans uh, is important. Uh, and, you know, this plan has uh, obviously gone through the ringer, and I want to pay tribute uh, to everybody who has been involved in it. I want to thank you sincerely for the work that you did as a public representative over many years, a lot of which went unnoticed, uh, and acknowledge the work that you've done uh, for this uh, Kerry um, Sports Partnership and Recreational Report as well. But um, finally, can I just say as well, I want to pay tribute to Michal Amara Hurtig, uh, who Jimmy replaced. Uh, needs no plaudits for me. We all know his work and the work that he has done, uh, both in terms of his commentary and in terms of his commitment to the development of not only the Gaelic Games, but the sport in general. So look, there are many elements in this report that will certainly prove um, uh, food for thought. Uh, and as I go around the country and I meet people like yourselves, I constantly come in touch with this. But at the end of the day, we can only develop um, the future of sports facilities, sports policy, and participation and really I suppose bridge that gap because we still have a huge gap uh, between uh, those that participate and those that don't and we have a cliff uh, for teenage girls particularly which we need to address um, but those challenges you know are there for all of us to work together to try and chart a way forward uh, and this plan uh, here in Kerry will play a part in that in terms of year development uh, and I look forward with my department uh, and through Sport Ireland the statutory agency in helping the evolution of plans like this around the country uh, and to show that we have a structured approach and a properly managed approach to the development of sport at a grassroots level in each one of our counties. So I want to wish it well. I want to congratulate everybody that has been involved in it and I look forward to the discussion later on. Um, I say I'm absolutely delighted this evening um, to be here and uh, to be part of the, the launch of the, the Kerry. Um, sports strategy, uh, recreation and sports strategy. So I think it's really, really important at a time when we talk about quality of life and, and when we talk about our well-being 
that this gives us a, a plan and a way forward for the next number of years. And you know, there are big commitments in the strategy, not just by any one party, but on behalf of the county. And uh, when you see the partnership that's there um, as part of the sports partnership, it really is a partnership. So, you know, there's a cross representation uh, there. And that's, that's how the best business is done. And that's where the, the real commitments are given. And that's all in partnership with Sports Ireland. So, I suppose when we come to the strategy and we look at the elements of the strategy that, that are really, really critical, I think the participation piece um, is really, really strong. And it has to be, because it talks about, about lifelong activities and the low participation groups. And again, when you see, and, and the Mayor, and, and the Cahirlo spoke earlier uh, here tonight uh, about the Community Support Fund. This is a really important fund that the members of Kerry County Council have set aside to support activities and groups across our county. We have park runs, park walks in, in many of our cases, uh, Pedal in the Park. And again, you know, they're, they're not targeted at any one section, they're targeted at every section of society and very much have become community events and have become very much core and part of what we are as a county. And so there's a lot done. Um, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're really trying our best here to, to, to make this work. Um, we're trying to work very hard at the partnership piece, the, the second part of the strategy. Um, and again, you know, it, it's something in a county like Kerry, which I'm sure is to be seen across other counties, but that partnership is very, very strong in Kerry. My message is, is very simple. And uh, we're in the business of trying to get people out exercising. But I suppose the, the critical piece for all of us, uh, and we all have to be advocates for sport and physical activity, uh, we're the converted. So we need to make sure that, that every time we have an opportunity, we try, to, we try to get someone out to get physically active and exercise and, and what have you. And we're all in that kind of business of trying to get people out. And, uh, the partnership has a key role around that and it is probably trying to identify those least uh, anxious to get out and get off the, get off the sofa and get out. So, and the disadvantaged areas, the disadvantaged communities. Uh, so it's really, really a critical piece that, that that has done very, very well. We need to make sure, obviously, that everyone walks together and that's a critical piece where at local level as well, and that's what the partnerships are about, making sure everyone is pulling together. And I, I suppose we will hear in a little while when we're all sitting around about the Department of Education and primary schools and secondary schools. And uh, that's a critical piece. And really, really, we need to close the gap there in terms of what our kids are doing and are not doing within sport and physical activity. And uh, we need to get away from, I know, I know it's important, the reading, the writing and the math, but we need to, need to get it and drill it into parents' uh, heads and brains that physical activity uh, is investment in, 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 in life for their children and it's about quality of life and, and a healthy child is an active child and an active child is a healthy, a healthy child. So we need to make sure we drum that message through to everyone in our daily activities. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening, a special welcome here no doubt for uh, my very good friend Patrick O'Donovan, as Minister for State and just to say Patrick congratulations on becoming Minister of State at such an early stage of your political cycle. Uh, so it's a great opportunity and honor for you, no doubt. And I was always very impressed with, with your enthusiasm and your commitment. So I'm sure you're going to do a wonderful job in this whole area and looking forward to working with you on behalf of the sports partnership as well. So look, this is a very important night. It's a great night for the county and thank you for all your attendance here. It shows the interest that you have and it sends out a very, very positive message that uh, we want to ensure that all of our people here in Kerry will get the opportunity uh, just to be active. And that is the whole, I suppose, that's our slogan, uh, getting the active more active and getting the less active active. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. So to kickstart uh, our conversation with sessions, we would like to show a wee clip which gives some insight into the dedication it takes to get where one wants to and spot who it is. The race isn't won on the day. 
It's in 5 a.m. starts, midnight finishes, and miles upon miles of water. Because the race is won long before it takes place. Our first conversation is facilitated by Joe O'Connor. Um, Joe is a fitness consultant to a number of individual athletes and oh, yeah. teams. However, we know Joe as probably best known as the referee on Ireland's fittest family. So, a warm welcome to everyone here this evening. again Cora. Um, so folks I suppose the, the, the theme of this panel is is looking at participation and involvement across the board and when we look at the, the getting the active more active and the less active active it's very important to realize that a lot of the benefits of physical activity um, are also involved in the mental side and the well-being well -being side of um, physical activity. Yeah, I'm going to ask the, each of the, the panelists uh, you know, questions related to their own past and the present and how they feel they can influence physical activity as well. And I'm going to start with Gavin. You're quite public in tanking sport and physical activity through your own background and, you know, at one point you said it saved your life. Could you maybe tell us your story and how that all developed? Yeah, so actually I was just talking with, a, with, a, with Ellen, Ellen before about swimming. I actually swam competitively uh, with the Galway Swimming Club as a teenager and I, I did quite well. I uh, swam at national level. Um, wasn't too far behind um, Andrew Bree who went on to represent Ireland in the Olympics and I stopped at 16 um, I believed I wasn't going to get any better at that time and, uh, and that's when I got into drugs and there was a lot going on in my family situation and I also was coming to terms with the fact that I was gay so there was a lot going on but it, it all stemmed down to the sort of mentality at the time you know and looking back you know I went into a sort of dark hole of alcohol and drugs you know for a number of years um, culminating the age of 21 where I try, try to take my own life you know so um, it you know it's it I was a relatively normal um, child and, and I did quite well in sport I could have probably gone on to do a lot better but somewhere along the lines you know I believed that uh, the, 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 you know that I wanted to take my own life and stuff so this is a huge a huge point really that um, you know there, there are more youths like that out there and um, it's an important point so what happened to me then is I got clean and I started surfing and uh, I, I really put that down to you know save my life um, and then culminating in, in, in going off and being a commercial diver all around the world. Uh, one thing led to another and then going on to roll the Atlantic just, just, just gone so you know it's hugely important to me physical activity and like you said the, the sort of the global sort of holistic sort of look at, at, at everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I believe you have uh, another rowing challenge coming up shortly. Yeah so I've, I haven't seemed to have enough of it so I'll be rowing back from to Galway in the summer, so yeah. <laughs> as you do, like. <laughs> what support do you think like, a strategy and a plan can put in place to support people to achieve both the, the physical but also the, the mental well being? Yeah, that's the key point. It's just, I suppose, um, realizing the connection that it's not just uh, that we're going out to sort of be physical um, because you know we want to stay healthy, like you know, physically. So it's that connection between the emotional and the mental side of things and the sort of the, the bigger picture stuff there you know so it's the bonding that happens it comes down to it's, a, it's quite a simple a simple thing and it's just you know taking responsibility ourselves you know and, and that's kind of where I'm trying to do now myself is just trying to inspire others you know and you know responsible to a level but not taking taking that on board you know we mm -hmm. aren't really you know it's very hard to get somebody off the couch you know but if we can just be sort of advocates for it you know and I think a big part of the support is that it doesn't have to be the massive, massive investment. You can use nature, and you've been an outdoor enthusiast, mm. you know, with the greenways and with the lakes and the rivers. Mm. We were talking earlier, Keith, about just making general accessibility more accessible for people. That's it, yeah. yeah. It doesn't cost anything, you know, to, to, and we have some world class, um, you know, stuff here, like the surf on the west coast of Ireland, you know, and mm -hmm. like I've, you know, done ultra marathons in the Arctic, I've rode across the Atlantic, and, mm -hmm. you know, it all started here. Like, this is this is the training ground. This is know where it's at it's, it's amazing we have it all out right on our doorstep it's right under our nose absolutely and, and i think as a country we, we box above our weight in, in so many different sports and i suppose Ellen, that brings me on to yourself as well you know 21 years of age uh, an olympic medalist which if you want to show this to the crowd here it's uh there you go a real <laughs> you know, 
just back from Copenhagen as well, winning gold in the Paris, Paris Swimming Leagues. Um, you've achieved an awful lot at a very young age, you know, but yeah. you've also come over adversity and, and met an awful lot of challenges. And for people in the audience who are not familiar with your story, could you, could you give us a, a summary of how do you get to Rio? <laughs> um, well, I was born um, without my left arm and uh, my parents kind of just accepted that and they didn't treat me any differently. So when it came to, uh, you have to learn how to swim because it's a life skill that you really need. Um, my parents just let me go with my brothers and my sister and my cousins treated me like any other child would do. And um, yeah, so I did my lessons then and I actually, I really hated lessons. I couldn't wait to be finished it. Um, there wasn't really a natural spark there, um, but I was given so many opportunities. It's amazing what abilities people have, but they get clouded by just looking at, you know, obviously. Yeah, and like personally, um, it may not seem it now, but when I was uh, going through my teenage years, every girl, every teenager really gets insecure about something and the insecurities come and mine really was being disabled and having no arm and like I'm in sleep now but if I was up here I'd be like hiding it, I'd be kind of trying to appear normal and because of swimming and because I was involved in sport I had nowhere really to hide and that's kind of where my confidence grew from that's and I kind of feel like there's a lot of disabled people out there who are too afraid to try mm -hmm. but that's where they're going to get the confidence in their own body and kind of feel, get their self-esteem back on. 100 percent and you know you, you spoke about the critical time when you were a teenage girl getting involved and in, in competing at the, the top level very young and I suppose a key aspect of the, the strategic plan is addressing different uh, age groups uh, throughout their development and one area that's really targeted is the involvement of teenage girls in physical activity. You know what supports do you think or what structures could be put in place to to make that transition over to physical activity and sport a little bit easier for the teenage girls? Um, well, I found my primary school was so supportive of everything that I did, and there were so many opportunities for physical activity in primary school, but as soon as I hit secondary school, all the workload increased, and um, people obviously became insecure about themselves. They didn't want to do a lot of things, and I was always off swimming, and um, I kind of felt like the school structure really limited me. Um, and there was also, we'd be doing PE, and maybe like we'd have two classes in the morning and then have PE, and then have to sit in our PE gear for the rest of the day. So nobody would really want to get that involved in PE because they didn't want to sit in sweaty clothes for the rest of, of the day. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other thing is the amount of option there was. It was always, oh, dodgeball, or go for a walk, or there wasn't really anything. The students never really had an impact. And what I kind of feel like, if you ask what they want, then they'll tell you what they want. And, and I think that feeds back to what you were saying earlier, to focus on abilities. Yeah, you know, exactly. That to, to ask people for feedback and to involve them in their own development of physical yeah. activity as well. And, you know, it's something that I was going to actually touch on with Keith later on, but, you know, sometimes we... we, we we pigeonhole sport and we pigeonhole physical activity, but there's a big crossover and it doesn't always have to be competitive. Exactly. And what we look at often is that there's major transitions in a, in a person's sporting career and the, the strategy looks at areas that are high risk and those who are finishing education, maybe starting uh, new employment or when they retire. So, excuse me, based on your experience and your involvement across that spectrum, the school kids and elite sport, what do you think can be done to improve the participation rates of those high-risk candidates? Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the difficult areas, definitely, uh, Joe. I think John made a point when he was speaking earlier about the importance of parents and the role that they have to play in encouraging their, their children to be very active from, you know, it doesn't have to be competitive, like you said there, but mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, the competitive juices are maybe what keeps them coming back the whole time and the thought of competition, even just playing against each other. Um, so I think you need that support at home and in a school setting the way that manifests itself is the notes that come in that Johnny's excuse from PE today or whatever, you know, for um, pretty trivial reasons. In terms of transitioning, I'm not sure what the answer is. I think education is very important and I think again there's been big improvements in that with the realisation for all of us how important it is to be active and uh, from a health point of view but also from a mental health point of view and trying to encourage maybe the less active to be active and 
the thing that you can always say to people is if you even go for a walk, you rarely come back from a walk and say, I shouldn't have done that. You know, most people enjoy it. Um, a point Gavin was making earlier about how lucky we are in Ireland um, with the outdoor facilities. We're doubly or trebly lucky in Kerry. Um, I mean, if you go out to Bannistrand on a, an evening after a day's work and if you've been challenged or whatever, and you go for a walk or a jog along the beach uh, and you air the head, you, you'll always feel 10 times better for it. Yeah. So I just think it's about being uh, educated and being aware of it. And the other drop off, you, you, like you said, is when people get jobs and they maybe move away from their own area. I think it'll be important for them to get involved in a club or get involved with a group anyway in some kind of a sport or even with a, one or two people that are going to the gym because if it's yourself thrown in the coach and there's a Champions League game on, it's easy to stay there. Whereas if you've another person to depend on or if a group is depending on you, you kind of feel like you have to go and that's probably just a practical thing that can help. But what I'd love to ask you is, you know, what can be really done to embrace the social side of physical activity, but from a sporting point of view? Well, I, I think at times, every time we talk about sport, we get a little bit caught in the idea of it being a team sport or an elite sport. and. Um, it, recreational sport, recreational activity is one of the key component parts. Of it. You know, we, we focus so much on sport being inclusive, but what about the kids that are excluded of sport and, and the long-term effects that they may not participate in physical, physical activity as a result? Is there anything we can do to say, if, if like, uh, you touched on kids striving of being picked, but what about little Tommy that isn't picked? You know, the long term effects on this key. If, if, if I can just, I, I, it's a, I have a bugbear for it, and I was a sports belly, so sport was easy for me. Of course. So it isn't, it, it, it's not for me, and I don't mean it in that fashion, mm -hmm. but physical activity and functional movement in primary school and secondary school is essential, but not within competitive sport, because the kids that are overweight or yeah. are not don't have great balance, or whatever the situation is, they can't be excluded from activity. So I think we need to have a look at the policy of what actually physical activity is in schools, mm -hmm. as to not being in competitive sport. Competitive is really, really important for those that it suits. Of course. Right? Yeah. And you're yeah. not excluding anybody else from that, but you do have to make certain that there is activity and physical um, improvements made mm -hmm. from the earliest age, that it is incremental, that, that the kids can do different things and achieve different skills, be it higher level of balance or proprioception, coordination, whatever it is, that's, that's essential. And it's where I think we get lost mm -hmm. between sport and activity. You know, what advice would you give to that parents or what supports do you think a strategic plan like this could implement to get those kids that Keith spoke about that aren't involved, more involved, or more active. Yeah, they have to do something anyway. I think the worst thing you can do is nothing. And um, I think you said it there yourself a couple of minutes ago that I know a couple of parents as well that are bringing that have been bringing their children to the kids run in the park on Sundays, and they get a great kick out of it, and the kids love it. And as a family, they get great crack out of it. And that's going back to the point that Keith, Keith was making there. That that's not down to talent. That's just down to getting out and doing something and. Um, I suppose as a parent you're going, there's a responsibility on you maybe to find something that does suit your, your child. It might be football or hurling or rugby or soccer or swimming or whatever, but there's something out there for everyone and um, just as long as they're active and they're not sitting in front of the TV or playing PlayStation the whole time and again, like you said earlier, there's, there's room for everything and there's balance there and that can be achieved. But even if it's only getting a dog and walking the dog every evening after school and having a relationship with the dog or whatever, there's, there's loads of ways if you use your imagination, but I just think, and it was the point that John made, that we just have to have be strong with regard to the importance of it from the parents' point of view, that the worst thing you can do is nothing, and once you're trying to do something, I think you'll definitely find a way. 100%, and I think it always resonates with me is that active parents lead to active kids as well. Uh, my last point, uh, Gavin, and, and, and the boys touched on it there, you know, participation in the team sports and in the physical activity and the park runs or the swim for a mile and so on. Just like yourself, I'm very passionate about the outdoors and the water sports and getting into the mountains and getting into our own headspace. What do you think can we, we can proactively do 
to kind of break down some of the barriers to, that are there for people that won't go to the hills or won't go to the sea or won't engage with the rivers and the lakes. Yeah, it's, it's tough, like um, the, the lads were saying there. It's, it's, it's trying to, I suppose, just convince people that it's, it's an overall well-being that we're looking at and it isn't just, you know, something born, that it is out there. So, um, and just learning the importance, I suppose, of that connection, you know, and, and the benefits that it, that it can have. So really just promoting, um, promoting that is really, really important. I think um, for me, like I said, uh, I, I went out and, and, and started surfing on the West Coast and it, uh, it, was, it was an amazing time and, and I spent years doing that and then went on to other stuff. But yeah, it really did save my life. So I suppose just trying to be an advocate for that um, uh, within, within the stuff that I do. Um, and trying to, yeah, just trying to encourage more people to to get outside and, and to try just simple stuff like you know, using the outdoors. Yeah, yeah we're absolutely blessed here in Kerry, exactly. like yeah. Valley City yeah. Forest, or you, you know, all the beaches, you've got the lakes. So. And I suppose, folks, I'll just conclude with one comment that, you know, the team of the strategic plan and the team of tonight is to get the, the active more active and the inactive active and to tie it all in with the biopsychosocial model where we have a balance between one's biology, their psychology and sociology. And I think the one message that we got from our panel this evening is that it's very important to bear in mind that the simple changes can make really big differences. You know, the support at home, the support with facilities that, uh, as Patrick touched on, sorry, Minister Donovan touched on earlier, you know, <laughs> having access to the schools for physical, activity, uh, physical activity facilities is very important as well. So guys, I'd like to thank each of our panellists tonight, and thank you very much, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Without doubt, uh, an inspirational note, insightful and very engaging conversation. So thank you to all our special con um, guests and to Joe and our facility for the discussion. Thank you. So to kickstart our second conversation, we go back in time to the summer of 1984. Uh, this man, John Tracy, has wholeheartedly supported the ethos of the Sports Partnership Network. It is through the support of Sport Ireland that um, there is a national focus on increasing the number of opportunities for all of us to participate in sport and physical activity. Tracy is third, obviously hurting a little. An Olympic and silver medal in his first ever marathon in the heat of Los Angeles. And John Tracy is looking good and this could be a sensation on his debut marathon. And anyway, we're coming towards the stadium. I think there were four or five of them in contention, but when they finally got to the gates of the Coliseum, there were three. It's Lopez, it's Tracy, it's Fedding. It's the Olympic Marathon of 1984. And I knew at that moment he was going to get a medal. I just knew it. Unless he collapsed. John Tracy has moved away from Spedding, and Tracy is bound for the Olympic podium. John Tracy appears in the stadium. He's very tired. 71, he's tired, but he's great and he's good and he's hanging on. Charlie's bidding just behind him. And there they were battling and battling away. But in the lead was Carlos Lopez, a great veteran from Portugal. Now, Lopez won the marathon, as you know, the gold medal, leaving two men on the track, John Tracy and Charlie Spedding of Britain. At this stage, I'm thinking of all the great Irish medalists since Ireland first competed in the Olympic Games, and now I know we're going to have another medal. So I, I thought to myself, if I can remember, and sometimes the memory is good, if I can remember in the last 100 metres of this race all of those medalists and pay my respects to them as Tracy comes in for a medal, it will, in one moment, envelop and embrace all of those who won medals for Ireland. They're going for silver, they're going for bronze. John Tracy is 100 metres to go. In the past, Ireland have won bronze medals. John Caldwell, Freddie Gilroy, Sax Byrne, Jim McCourt, New Russell. They've won gold. Paddle Callaghan twice, Bob Tiss and Ron Delaney. They've won silvers with John McNally, Fred T, Wilkinson, Wilkinson. And for the 13th time, an Irish medal goes to John Tracy. <laughs> A wonderful occasion for John Tracy and for Irish sport in general. What he had achieved was mighty. It elevated him way up there in the pantheon of Irish greats. Well done, John. <laughs> Our 
conversation will be facilitated by Una Moynihan. Una is a lecturer in the Institute of Technology Tralee, specialising in the area of sports development, community studies and strategic planning. So I think I'll hand it over to you, Una. Thank you, Cora. Uh, I suppose the purpose of our, our chat here this evening really is to uh, tease out some of the issues that, uh, that were uh, addressed earlier. So uh, the local sports partnership really is about uh, getting the active more active and getting the less active active. And they do that by working with a whole array of really important providers. So what I'd like to ask the panel is, what strengths would you advise the providers who are here tonight to develop in order to become good at partnering with other organisations to make uh, sport and physical activity an opportunity for everybody in the community? I'll jump in if, if you want, because the guys are being shy. I've, I've given up on shy. <laughs> well, you won't. Yeah, have. I <laughs> have. I have. <laughs> uh, communication, um, which is funny because the guys weren't saying anything. But um, <laughs> we the, um, the you should be very careful <laughs> slagging <laughs> off a minister <laughs> in a group. Um, the <laughs> what ways making people who are um, active more active? It's the other group are, are the ones that aren't active at all, and why aren't they active? In terms of communication, we're talking community all the time, and the sports partnerships are doing phenomenal work. And actually, there's a huge sense of energy that you see in all the counties at the moment because it isn't in the county town, it's everywhere. There's that link of communication that's going in. So I actually think the framework is already there. That level of communication that's required from the sports partnerships to bring everybody along with them, to say that there isn't... Um, any impediment to actually getting involved. The park run is truly, truly phenomenal. We have one in Killaloo, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to see it. You know it at half nine, every single Saturday morning it's gonna happen somewhere. Um, but 5K run is, could be the equivalent of rowing across the Atlantic to people who can't. So from a little idea with people walking together, you can achieve an awful lot. And that's really what the partnership is around, looking for opportunities and seeing then if there's a nugget in that, that you can drive it. Lovely, so it's about joining the dots between the, the various dots. Uh, yeah. groupings who have something to bring to yeah. them. Um, if we're going to be serious about you know, teaching children and giving them a, a, a skill set, and Keith is absolutely right in the earlier comment in relation to uh, taking the competitive element out, um, because if you're long-sighted and short-sighted, uh, and you have the lung capacity of 33%, which is what I had as a child, um, you find yourself fairly quickly being left out of the competitive environment. And what Jimmy said and what John said there while it was right as well, the first thing I actually believe uh, for people who aren't engaged, uh, they should be done with them, is ask them why they aren't engaged. Um, and nobody asks the individual themselves why they aren't engaged. We as policy makers and as people that are interested in it, we surmise as to why they mightn't be and we try and fix it for them instead of asking them why are they not engaged. Uh, and to me that's, you know, as somebody who was that person talking over their head as to why they're not engaged is a bit patronising to be honest about it and, and actually probably drives them even further underground. If we're funding the, the construction of new schools and new communities across the country then they have to be at the centre of the community. And John and Keith and Jimmy and myself were talking about this a while ago. You know, you have fields now being developed at every four crossroads. And it's great. Uh, you know, you have a GA field and a soccer field and a rugby field and then you have a school inside in the middle of it. And they all have their own facilities. And they're all locked for most of the day and people are looking in at them. Um, wouldn't it make an awful lot more sense if we had a single location in the heart of the community which is open to the kids who are using it during the day, the elderly people or whatever can use it and the active retired can use it also during the day and then at night it becomes the hope for the parents and at the weekend everybody's using it but instead we have this mindset, it is my field you know and it is almost like the bird and the bull McCabe uh, and that's never going to work and unless we change that mindset again you know it's involved, it, it will involve standing on a lot of toes, the first toes that have to be stood on are the Department of Education, they are reluctant to change um, but I think there is going to have to be a change because we have a very small amount of money we're a small country, and when, when John Tracy gave me the names of the people in New Zealand to meet when I was out there, you know, they take a totally different approach to the development of sport to what we do. And it's not about this kind of, uh, you know, staking your claim and planting your flag in a field and blocking everybody else out. That's not the mentality. And, it, and it is, while we're a sports med country, that philosophy is not serving us well, I don't believe. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
Just on, on that point as well, the National Lottery was introduced about uh, 1987, and if there had been a policy back then that the community facility would be put adjacent to the school ground or on the school ground, nearly every school in the country would have a facility at this stage. But there are several examples where uh, the National Lottery funding was put into a centre maybe half a mile from the school, and for those of us that were teachers, to have to walk your class down to a facility a half a mile away, it just doesn't happen, they get cold, they get wet, and so on. But if it's on the site, even if you're not a PE teacher, you give them a ball, and they go in there and they enjoy themselves, so you can run them around the hall and so on. So I think that policy, which has changed now to some extent, uh, schools can apply now for National Lottery funding with the support of clubs. And clubs, like they are the lifeblood, really, the schools are the lifeblood of all the clubs. And it's uh, very important for clubs to be involved in their schools. I know there's overlap. I'll shift the debate a little bit, right, because I think what we're talking about is really makes perfect sense, right? Perfect sense, community sharing with schools and what have you. Let me just move on to the debate, just a piece. Um, sporting organisations and different disciplines of different sports, many of them feel that they're competing for the hearts and minds of the children, competing against each other. We need to get away from that mindset as well, because I always think there's a sport there for everyone, irrespective of abilities or disabilities. And I think we all have a, have a duty kind of, okay, you'd be good at this, try that, what have you, right? Or the talented kid in the school, or the talented three or four, they're dragged here, there, and everywhere for the same, for different sports. I think we need to change our thinking around that. Uh, it, it, it will take a shift, a huge shift, but I think we need to shift it and, and, and try to direct kids into sport they might love and enjoy for life and that's the thing we're in that business we're in that for, for now all the research that tells us is tells us that kids are involved individual sports stay involved for longer and the team sports is a drop off and then they might join later on so there's a, that's a, a whole piece i think that we need to look at and examine just a small point on, on club and school um, and also club and how it looks after its uh, members when they give up football or give up Poland or rugby or whatever. I think that there should be a policy in every club where they try to keep people with the club. And in some places now they have a little run and track around the pitch mm. that people use. The whole purpose of the strategic plan is about getting the active more active and the less active active. And I suppose w research has shown that Kerry has an above average age relative to the national age profile, so we're that little bit older in Kerry um, than, than the rest of the country. And, that, and as a result, in the strategic plan, there's, the, you're, you're, the, the, there's an intention to promote lifelong physical activities, those that will uh, be sustained at every age. So I suppose, again, my question really relates to what additional supports need to be put in place in order to make the active choice the easy choice for every member of the community, including the marginalised groups that you've referred to already, Keith. Is there something more that we should be doing? Um, and I take your point about um, perhaps making clubs appreciate that they don't have to cut each other off in order to win the hearts and minds of, of, of individuals. How might we go about making that happen? Has anybody well, any Well, I, I think that continuation, that when you give up the sport of the club you're in, that it shouldn't necessarily mean that you just cut off links with that club, that you should stay with that club and there should be programmes there for the participants right up to they pass away from this world. In various ways, it could be uh, providing them with access to the gym or if there was a circle around the pitch. So uh, all clubs in, then should be thinking about They should continue. And, and it's a source variety. of income as well. Yeah. It's a source of membership. And most clubs just forget about people when they stop, when they can't use them to play in their teams. But there should be a sport and policy, and the people themselves will continue. They'll keep it going. Now, oh, mind you, it's beginning to happen, but not to the same extent. And that way, you would get even the spatial distribution of, say, GA clubs in Kerry. You would touch every parish um, with that kind of policy and encourage more people rather than the people who are actually playing with the clubs in as well. And 
that's one way of doing it. But I think the big picture will only be resolved uh, when we decide how we're going to value people's physical activity. And if we don't, well then we don't expect different results. But if we do, it's going to take you know, money, it's going to take a policy change, and it's going to take a mindset change within politicians in the first instance, and then within you know, the institutions of the state to say, this is something worth investing in. And I go back to where I started a while ago. We got two medals at this year's Olympics. New Zealand got 18. We have 100,000 people, more than them. So it is not insurmountable. They're a sports med country, but they do things differently. We have a good physical infrastructure now in place in terms of statutory agency, uh, led by John, and a whole range of sports partnerships. Now what we need to do, I think, is change uh, the mentality of some of the key stakeholders. Okay, that's uh, no small task indeed. <laughs> um, anybody well, else care to... What well, I, I think, obviously, from listening to the Minister, uh, it must be kind of cross the departmental and interagency, and then connecting with all of, all the, the voluntary organisations, sporting organisations. That dynamic would have to be there in order to get the desired results. Uh, but certainly, it's worth, I suppose, playing for, uh, because the future of our country, like, is very much dependent on that attitude towards an act of Ireland. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The debate is, sometimes the debate is around quality of life. And quality of life is where we should be. And when you're talking about quality of life, you're talking about physical infrastructure. And I, I'll cite, and I'll boast a little bit now about the Greenway in Waterford, is, <laughs> is uh, that's a facility that's on people's doorsteps. And it's, it's basically creating an environment that lends itself to physical activity between Waterford and Dungarvan. And it's driven by communities. It's driven by local people. And a uh, fantastic facility that was opened this last weekend. It is about creating those type of pieces. And I think government are getting this. The Taoiseach certainly gets it. The minister gets it. Jimmy Deanahan got it, always got it. You know, it's, it's, about, it's about creating the opportunity for people to have a quality of life through physical activity. Excellent, lovely, thanks very much. Like a, lot, a lot of people wait for government to do things. Mm. And you have to harass the government mm. to do it. Because the government have an awful lot to do. Mm. And, um, but suddenly, you annoy them enough you know, they'll want to do something back and, and uh, you know, it can't work in a vacuum, it needs all sides. And we said it three or four times, bottom up and top down, otherwise nothing happens. Well, Keith has done very well in that respect. He has really annoyed a lot of ministers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and will again. Excellent. Well, that, that's what you want. Look, I think, folks, this evening we really only got to scratch at the surface and yet we had fantastic um, input in terms of the importance of having a vision, the importance of people collaborating and working together and understanding that it is about hearts and minds in every interpretation of that uh, phrase. Um, and I suppose the, the, the real message to give to everybody who's here is A, you're doing really important work. B, you know, you, you, you can keep doing that really important work. And, and see, you'll probably get more out of that really important work if you can find ways to collaborate and to work together. And there are people who have um, a prior experience at community level and at government level and, and at state institution level who are there in the background to offer the support that is needed in order to make the active choice, the easy choice for all citizens, irrespective of age or ability, gender or ethnicity. Thank you very much. For Good job, to a close, our thank Good yous job, have been expressed in our slideshow. Without those who support this journey could not happen or continue to move forward. Our Chief Executive of Kerry County Council, Moira Murrell, she acknowledged and listed the partners on the board. Um, it's a fantastic board, um, a connected board, uh, a board that communicates, that therefore makes the collaborative work so much more easier for us all. Um, we move in the right in the same direction. Our next step though the partnership is to continue to implement our actions and extend an invitation to the wider public to become involved in this journey. A special thanks to our speakers and invited guests who made this launch a very special evening and I think a round of applause for that Phil
collaborative work, lastminute.com, to the support of Kerry TV and the broadcast production unit. They are here tonight and they filmed this evening's proceedings so we can capture it. And Khalakwina a Hashtal Tamil Father Leve and Shaw Anot, Mila Mahagav, Agas Kadesha Sloan Awalia. And finally, uh, quite a number of people have travelled a distance, so we wish you all a safe journey home and uh, Ihiwa. Thank you.